Hey everyone, Brian Zane here, and yes, this year I'm dressed as Oliver Humperdinck from Halloween Havoc 89. It was a last minute thing. Folks, I gotta be real with you. Due to the somewhat racy nature of this week's movie and what with all the overzealous bots cracking down on my channel as of late, I'm afraid this might be my riskiest review since Wanna Be the Strongest in the World. Needless to say, I am not monetizing this video just to be on the safe side. That's why I'm glad Surfshark VPN is here to sponsor my review of American Angels Baptism of Blood. Yes, friends, not only does Surfshark keep your private information safe in an unsafe online world, they're sponsoring this video so you can enjoy a review for a movie about scantily clad women who enter the wrestling ring for fame and fortune. Oh yeah! Surfshark helps you gain access to different streaming libraries from around the world with thousands of global servers, just like they're giving you access to this review, which has potential naughty bits. Surfshark's the best. And now you can download it by going to the link in the description. Get 83% off and three extra months for free with the promo code REGRET. Yes! Finally a movie that combines two of my favorite things, pro wrestling and softcore nudity. It's everything I ever wanted! Oh, now hold on young me, I think you should sit this one out. Aw oh, come on man, I'd go on the computer but mom's hogging the phone line, I need to see this! Trust me, for future me self, you really don't, okay? Just go back to your room and keep playing Blitzball till you get the Sun Sigil so you can unlock Waka's ultimate weapon, okay? Nope, fine. It's a good thing Blitzball's a good minigame. Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's the shit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's the wet regret. Let's get it, yeah. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on, get called to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Let's do it, regret. Let's get it, yeah. American Angels is a 1989 pulp film about a group of ladies that joins a popular touring women's wrestling show of the same name. The trio navigates through pain, jealousy, and checkered pasts, all while learning the ropes of the wrestling business. It was one of the final films written, directed, and produced by husband and wife team Ferd and Beverly Sebastian. That's right, Ferd. These two were a couple of filmmaking dynamos, having worked on about a dozen self-financed films together in the 70s and 80s. They mostly worked in the sexploitation genre, carrying on a legacy made famous by directors like Roger Corman and Russ Meyer. Their work includes such classics as The Hitchhikers, The Single Girls, Gator Bait, and Gator Bait 2, The Legend of Curly's Gold. Wait, I'm sorry, I meant Cajun Justice. And it wasn't just them, this stuff was a family affair. They had two sons, Tracy and Ben, who worked almost exclusively with their parents over the years as actors, associate producers, or co-writers. Ferd and Bev themselves wore multiple hats, not just running the show, but also handling cinematography, set design, editing, and more. These folks definitely put their all into their work. Ben was a co-writer on Angels, which should come as no surprise given who starred in this movie. Meet young starlet Jan Sebastian, known here as Jan McKenzie. Her look combined girl-next-door innocence with raw sex appeal, making her cinematic debut a year or two earlier as the heroine of Gator Bait 2. It was there she met her future husband, Ben, thereby also securing her gig as the lead of American Angels. Trained for the film by longtime journeyman wrestler Alex Knight and surrounded by a bevy of legitimate female workers, Jan had a lot of assistance going into this. And with that, I think I've given you all the background I can on this thing, so let's get started. Are you mean enough? Are you brutal? Are you without mercy? Then. In a creative piece of marketing, the VHS copy of the movie opens up with a fairly lengthy commercial for a contest where you can meet the angels in person by calling into their 1-900 number. I really hope somebody won that. You can answer two incredibly easy questions about the American Angels video. Oh, God, why would you use that sound effect? Good God, okay, now that we're done with that, let's just dive right in. Ah, a fine choice of words I had there. The opening credits float in front of this glisteny, jiggly, super slow-mo match featuring the Queen of the Angels, the Magnificent Mimi. We meet the commentary team, a guy who looks like Will Ferrell, and a guy who looks like Lee Marshall. Wait a minute, that guy is Lee Marshall! The other guy is Diamond Dave, played by Trey Lauren, a man with some of the biggest eyebrows you ever did see. Dave is the promoter and head recruiter for the Angels, basically this movie's version of David McClane, or his Netflix counterpart, Bash Howard. Bash, of course, being short for Sebastian, which... Oh my god, is this movie an influence on the Glow series? We also meet the other major players in this picture. There's Maria Rita, who's watching the show as a fan. Then we cut over to Pam, a woman who's trapped in Chicago's seedy underbelly. 
Okay, so first of all, how the lady behind her not react to what just happened? And second, was she meant to block the shot so it looked like Pam just tripped and fell into the alley? Pam gets roughed up by her pimp, gang leader Eddie. If you squint your eyes, he kind of looks like a young Jimmy Snuka, which makes this scene of domestic violence all the more hard to get through. Ooh, look at that joint manipulation. Eddie's played by actor Greg Bird, whose biggest claim to fame was being a stand-in for Tupac Shakur in the Jim Belushi Tupac Shakur film Gang Related. Good for him. Then there's our hero, Lisa. She competes in sexy wrestling matches at a strip club to pay the bills, but she's got big dreams of being a world champion. Diamond Dave scouts for her at the club and is especially impressed with her talent when she punches a guy in the balls for taking her top off and gives him a snapmare. Shades of Luthez himself. Double D tries to make his pitch to Lisa while she's showering. She throws a whole locker room's worth of stuff at him to get him to leave, but not before he drops his card. I'm a pretty good wrestler. Well, it looks like he got over the whole stranger seeing you naked thing fairly quickly. I'm glad that's smoothed over. It's time for off-season tryouts to see who will join the American Angels. All three of our heroines are there, and you can tell that Lisa's all about being a wrestler. I mean, just look at the back of her jacket. The auditions take place in front of Dave and Mimi, who are an item, and head trainer Patty, played by veteran wrestler Susan Sexton. And speaking of vets, Big Bad Mama from the original Glow shows up here as Big Mama. Kind of like when the Big Boss Man was just called The Boss in WCW for a few weeks. Maria Rita's hired because she checks off the Latino demographic, which I think explains how she got the whole acting gig in the first place. Pam's up next, and we see her unleash some pent-up rage on her opponent. Well, I think the girl on the bottom screaming for her life is a better wrestler. Yeah, but the one on top's an animal. Yeah, but Dave, I'm a wrestling coach. I'm not an animal trainer. My God, what amazing dialogue. It's finally Lisa's turn against Big Mama, and though Lisa's able to hold her own for a bit, the ridiculous size contrast makes Dave laugh repeatedly on a loop. <laughs> Well, I didn't think we could find a sadder laugh track than the Big Bang Theories, but here we are. Anyway, the only three girls we're meant to care about pass the auditions and will start training henceforth. Dave goes to check on Lisa, which immediately makes Mimi jealous and suspicious. Let me give you some advice. Stay away from him. Mimi thinks he's her property. She's not crazy about competition. <laughs> oh, women. They so controlling. The three ladies room together and begin to open up about each other. Maria Rita's parents don't want her wrestling because they think it's a sin, and that's the only thing you ever learn about her as a person. Lisa drops some foreshadowing by saying her grandfather would hate to see her wrestling, and Pam... My mom was a whore and a drunk. She kicked me out when I was 13 years old. Well, here's to three rotten apples. Well, damn, that seems kind of cold. Patty puts the gals through the ringer with some bump drills, and naturally, Lisa takes to it like a fish to water. The girls return to the locker room to see the crew of angels welcoming them to the group with some cake, but as is tradition in wrestling, they wind up wearing it. <laughs> Then the whole crew has a fun, messy, sexy good time. None of the actual wrestlers get naked in this scene, but there's still plenty of skin to be had. It's a perfect glimpse into what locker rooms are really like. Man, have I got some stories to tell. Hoo -hoo. Oh God, not in the floor, lady. After all that female bonding, it's time to film their matches for their cable customers in a dark, empty building with no referee. Cable customers. Sure, folks. Magnificent Mimi bests Black Venus, then gets into a scrap with a lady named Margot who you never see again. This blink and you miss it cameo is by Tiffany Mellon, original glow wrestler turned pornographic actor and director. Ah, ah, for Christ's sake, get these bitches out of here, dude. Boy, you never heard outbursts like that in the WCW Road Reports. After the match, a frustrated Venus throws her weight around with Lisa, then spars with the team's resident helper, Samson. And what a combination. If there was a type of wrestler who was thought of perhaps even less than women at the time, it was little people. Come on, twist him. Twist him. Make that little midget squeal. Best line of the movie. Lisa feels bad for Samson's plight and decks Venus from behind. But little does she know, it's all a work. Out of my act. It's my specialty. What the hell got into her? With shit like that, you won't last five minutes around here. The other vets get mad at Lisa for her ignorance, but sorry, when everything so far in the movie's been treated like a shoot, it's hard to feel like Lisa was in the wrong. Why are they mad at her for not being smart enough to the business, which is kind of their responsibility in the first place? As Mimi starts to realize she's losing her grip on Dave, Samson tries to cheer Lisa up by showing him his ankle trick again. Blah, please stop. It's not exactly important to the movie, but I do respect them for doing this entire two-minute scene in a single shot. 
Diamond Dave meets with his crew, Patty, Mimi, and a guy who at first I thought was a time-traveling Levi Shapiro. How can they boost sagging ratings for the show's next season? Mimi suggests a no-holds-barred match with her new rival Lisa and promises to make her bleed. Right, what are you trying to do, kill her? She's real green. Oh, it's gonna be real all right. It's gonna be an ass kicker. Well, wait a minute. Now suddenly wrestling's a shoot again and Lisa's in genuine danger? Can we please get more than like two movies that make it clear in their world whether or not wrestling is a work? But Mimi is thrown for a loop when she learns the truth about Lisa's past, that she's actually the granddaughter of famous wrestler Killer Kane. I love it. I love it. The press is gonna soak this up like a buffalo shitting golden nickels. <laughs> Here's a pointless shot of Dave rolling his motorcycle into his garage, which is also his office. Yep, nothing quite like the smell of exhaust to get those promotional juices flowing. Mimi gets in the ring during practice and immediately takes liberties with Lisa. I mean, when you're busting out the monkey flip, you're really pushing it in there. What a bully. Lisa and Pam, but not Maria Rita for some reason, are recovering in the steam room. Of course they have a steam room. Pam takes a phone call in there, which I didn't know those had phone service. How did you find me? I, I don't owe you nothing. Hey, I feel you, Pam. Robo calls, am I right? Lisa and Dave then have a heart-to-heart -heart in the ring. Dave wants to pull Lisa out of the big match to keep her safe, and also warns her against ever using the snap, which was Killer Kane's old finisher, which did actually kill someone in the ring one time. Lisa naturally changes Dave's mind by initiating horseplay that leads to their own live sex celebration in the ring. I sure hope they clean the mats beforehand and after. Oh, and in the next scene we learn that Samson totally heard them doing it because he lives under the ring. All this time I thought it was just Hornswoggle who did that. We get a war of words with Magnificent Mimi and Luscious Lisa to hype up the match being billed as the Baptism of Blood. Damn, and you thought rivalries beginning with the stipulation match was some new phenomenon. Lisa promises not to use the snap in their match because it's too dangerous, and Mimi calls Lisa a carrot top midget for the 20th time. Back at the pad, guess which evil pimp has found out where Pam lives. Pull your eyes and piss in your brain. Pam explains she refused to sell Eddie's drugs to elementary school children. <laughs> Typical gang leader. So she threw them away and skipped town, and now he's found her again. The girls promise to keep her safe. Give him a drop kick right into his spinet. No spinet? <laughs> That's one of her last real bits of dialogue all movie, and there's like a half hour left to go. You can't have an 80s film without a montage, and this film hits you with both barrels, sexy workouts, and more bump drills. Gotta admit, watching them practice second rope splashes onto nothing is kinda weird. We even get a glimpse of what the snap could be before Lisa writes a letter to her grandpa that explains everything, that wrestling is in her blood and her pleas for him to come to the show. Grandpa and his geese friends have some thinking to do. Love always, Lisa. What's up, guys? The gals go running on the beach when, surprise, two dancers from the Beat It video are here and are looking to cut some bitches. Chill! Let's beat the meat! Before we slice it. Lisa comes from out of nowhere with a distraction, and the girls fight back against the baddies with their kick-ass wrestling skills. Bitch, I'm breaking out of the socket! Ah. ah, typical wrestling fashion. Gotta wait for them to do the spot before you make the save. I'm gonna do it! It's finally time for the big show here in this mostly full arena. Gotta admit, for a show with this much hype, I was expecting a bigger house. We are ready for one of the most historic and one of the most exciting events in all of sports. The first match sees Pam as a genie teaming up with a lady who's rocking the one-legged tights before Zack Ryder made it cool. She's replacing Maria Rita, who broke her arm in the fight on the beach and can't compete. Sure, she's done nothing of note so far in this movie, so why start now? They take on the team of Biker Mama and Black Venus, and it's a match. Just a regular old match. Pam takes the pinfall in the end, and you never see her again in the movie. I'm assuming she's okay and that Eddie didn't come back with reinforcements. Maria Rita. Gracias. <laughs> she's not dead. If you want to thank her, just wait a few minutes and she gets back there. Then Mimi cuts a mini promo to herself? To the camera? To Lisa, maybe, if they're on opposite ends of the same dressing room? We don't know. It's main event time. Luscious Lisa gets a massive ovation from the crowd despite having never wrestled a match before. And goddamn, look at the entrance attire for Magnificent Mimi. Yas Queen, we stan! And look, Grandpa Killer, not to be confused with the murder grandpa, is here to watch Lisa's big debut. I love how they're promoting a match as a potential bloodbath at what is very clearly a family show. 
Lisa begins the match with a unique fighting style combining judo and flash dance. They keep wrestling for 16 minutes. 16 minutes?! A 16 minute block of straight up wrestling? And that's it? I mean, Vern Gagne and Billy Robinson only went 5 in 1974. What's these girls' excuse? This means the only dialogue you hear for the bulk of the film's climax is of Lee Marshall calling the action by himself non-stop. I'm not saying he's bad here because he isn't, there's just too much of him. And more often than not, he's fighting his own dubbed voice. I've had a thousand times before, I just don't know how these ladies got The sound mixing really falls off the rails in this last match. At one point, Mimi does a big knee drop and makes some weird video game noise when she does it. And then, oh, right down on the left leg. Still, it's better than some of the sounds you've heard so far. <laughs> Goo! Stop! Lisa draws first blood with a drop kick right to the snoot. And aside from a little bit of red mess on her own face later, that's literally all the crimson you get in this baptism of blood match. The referee's knocked out of the ring, but the two keep fighting. I mean, considering the magnitude of this match, this is for all the marbles right here. Ooh, shots fired at the predecessor over here. Speaking of which, if this movie came out eight years after all the marbles, why does it barely look better? The match goes on with several shots of Gramps cut in, either looking happy or sad depending on the flow of the match. At one point he's even openly weeping. Who said man can't cry in wrestling? Lisa's full of fighting spirit as Grandpa tells her to use the snap. And... So the snap is a springboard somersault dropkick. That was Grandpa's old move, and nobody was calling him out for killing the business back then? Mimi's knocked out, and Dave gets in the ring to revive her while Lisa is crying. Why? She's been a bitch to you all movie, and you just beat her, albeit unofficially. She clearly isn't. The match is thrown out, and Mimi's title does not change hands, but the crowd spontaneously storms the ring in approval, they hoist the two rivals into the air, and then they embrace? Why? Doesn't Mimi still hate Lisa's guts for stealing her man, then kicking her ass? Welcome to the American Angels. That she indeed... So, does this kind of shit happen on every episode of the show? Look, I know B-movies aren't really meant to be critically acclaimed, so it shouldn't be a surprise to you that I don't find much good about this one. It's not a great movie by any stretch, but I will say, compared to some other things I've seen lately, it's a lot better than that. No, the writing isn't great, the acting is wildly inconsistent, and the production seems way behind the times. Samson says in an earlier scene that it takes talent to make somebody laugh. On the flip side, it takes talent to make a story about beautiful women and backstage turmoil and wrestling boring. If there's something I can put over, it's that at least the wrestling itself is fine. Even though the final match was way longer than necessary, I have to give Jan Sebastian, Mimi, and the trainers credit for at least making it look convincing. As for the Sebastian clan, their story continues to this very day. In a post-movie video message on the DVD version of the film, Ferd and Beverly explain how they made one more movie together in 1993 before retiring from filmmaking and finding Jesus. Beverly went on to found the National Greyhound Foundation, one of the country's leading organizations dedicated to the rescue and adoption of racing greyhounds. Jan never took another acting role, but killing rapey swamp hicks and body slamming ladies in spandex pale in comparison to her wildest gig yet, being being the co-runner of a $17 million Ponzi scheme with her husband, Ben. The couple was shut down by the SEC in the summer of 99, accused of selling fraudulent notes to investors and spending the money made to create Real Life 101, an educational show for kids about different jobs and careers. The show did get made and is still in production to this day, but the Sebastians spent the rest of the money to buy a house, travel the world, and a whole bunch of other rich person shit. The TV show was sold off, and despite some frantic online searches, I can't find anything as to what actually happened to Ben and Jan afterward. Guess they can always fall back on cinema. If you appreciate B-movie schlock and enjoy the in-ring stylings and the loud fashion of companies like Glow and LPWA, where many of the ladies in this movie worked, then American Angels may be right up your alley. Just don't go in expecting any blood, or at least not enough to baptize somebody with. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. I mean, I've seen the big tubs in the churches.